What's up, traders? Anthony Crudelli here, and thank you for tuning into this live stream of the Futures Radio Show podcast. If you're watching on Twitter, please give us a retweet. And if you're on YouTube, hit that like button and that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode of the Futures Radio Show podcast. Today, we're going to be discussing trading psychology with one of the best in the business, in my opinion, the best in the business, Denise Show. Everyone spends a ton of time talking about macro and charting, but I don't think traders spend enough time discussing the psychology that goes into becoming a trader. Today, Denise and I will dig into the depths of trading psychology, and we will be taking your questions live, so be sure to put them in the YouTube chat. Before we get into all of that, I want to remind all of you about Micro Treasury Futures. They are now live, and I am actively looking at the Micro Treasury Futures on my charts to see what the yields are doing. Pull up these symbols, 2YY, 5YY, 10Y, and 30Y. And to learn more about micro treasury yield futures, go to cmegroup.com. Futures Radio Show is sponsored by CME Group, Trading Technologies, Trade Station, and FTSE Russell. The Russell 2000 is a key benchmark for small cap U.S. stocks. Be sure to check out the E-mini Russell 2000 futures symbol RTY and micro E-mini Russell 2000 futures symbol M2K. To learn more about FTSE Russell and their products, please visit footsierussell.com. Denise, how are you, my friend? Hey, I'm great. Good to see you, Anthony. Great to see you. Thank you so much for doing this live. I really appreciate it. You know, we've done a ton of podcasts before. And recently I was going over my stats. You know that you and I have the most popular podcast we've ever done on Futures Radio Show was with you and I. It was when I, when I discussed my heart attack. Oh, right. Yeah. And that was- For uh, good reason. I, yeah, it was a challenging time in my life, and and you're a great friend, and I think that you are the best when it comes to tackling trading psychology. And I know so many traders that speak with you, and and how much you have helped all of them. So speaking with you live today is great. And like I said in the intro, we're going to be taking questions live, everybody. You're going to get some access to Denise today, so be sure to put your questions in the YouTube chat. But Denise, the first thing I want to talk about is is mental edge a real thing? <laughs> <laughs> nah, it's not. It's all a waste of time. It actually totally is. And it's an edge that's really in any individual's control. So, you know, all kinds of people can figure out what to do, but it's doing it that makes you money or loses you money. So, like, what uh, fuels doing it? Your psychology, you know. I think of it as psychological capital, mental capital. Um, yeah, it's a thing. So you say psychological capital, mental capital. And the reason why I wanted to start off with that today be is because traders go through a process, right? Uh, I have a show called Develop Your Edge, and I do talk regularly about psychology. But I think so many traders spend so much time, Denise, trying to figure out the macroeconomic picture. They try to find the perfect technical strategy. They look for all these other things. They spend so much time trying to develop edge, uh, whether it's through macros or math or charts or whatever it is. And I don't think enough people think that, that the mental side of thing is an actual edge because I don't know that you can actually put your finger on it. Explain to everybody how the mental edge how traders actually can have a mental edge and use that to become better traders. Yeah. So it, it, it like, we have to get almost philosophical for a second. I mean, the market is nothing but other people executing on prices for whatever reason. Like it's a social mechanism of perception. Like there's no actual reality. Like it's a social mechanism. So, that's a human thing. And like we tend, particularly when we're first starting, I mean, I can remember this. Um, my dog is barking. I hope he's not I love that. Us. Okay. <laughs> um, I gave him one of those chewy things, but he must have finished it. In any event, um, so there's research that shows like the more we're using our ability to read other people, the better we are at predicting price action. So like, it doesn't matter whether you're using charts or fundamental analysis, all you're doing is saying, I think other people are going to react this way, push the price up or down. Well, 
our prediction of other people is very tied to our own mental slash emotional state. So there's the part of mental emotional state that's literally about understanding the market better because you're using your own humanity to understand the other market participants. Um, and then there's the part of mental emotional state that's risk management so that you're not just acting out your own impulses and like your desire to make money or your need to be right or your fear of being wrong or your fear of missing out. Like, so there's two sides, both market strategy that really has to be about other people, which is really based in your own understanding of like the crowd. But then the risk management side, which is really you managing, doing the things you want to do, being able to, to uh, execute on that market read. So, I mean, mental edge is both of those and you can, you can certainly do market read without risk management and then you give all your money back. You can do risk management with not so much market people read and you do okay, but you don't do as well as you could. If you do both sides of that coin, like using your own mental state to understand the market read side, and to understand your own self-management side, then you've really got an edge over everyone who's either not doing either or certainly anyone who's only doing one. Does that make sense? Totally. I agree with that a hundred percent. I think, I think the one thing that a lot of tr newer traders or traders that have been doing this for a short period of time, don't know when that falls into the timeline because I tweet a lot about trading psychology right now. I mean, for years I have. Yeah. I mean, you and I first yeah. did a podcast on this over four years ago, almost five years ago. It's hard mm -hmm. to believe it was that long ago. But I'm at a certain point in my career where I focus a lot more on that than the technicals because I look at my charts for 30 seconds. I can evaluate where I'm at with my strategy. So I've established that. At what point do you do you tell the traders to say, it, it, like, what is the timeline to getting to that self-awareness moment that trading psychology is now something I have to work on? And what do I work on to get better? Well, you know, there's there's kind of two ways to answer that. One is if you think about it from the very beginning. And the other is if you think about it like learning to swing a golf club. So, you know, on some hand, learning to swing a golf club, like you have to have someone teach you, you know, how to hold the club and where to take it back and what to do with your arms and all that. And there's like basic things or swing a baseball bat. Um, but golf and baseball, etc. there is a literal physics to it that you have to learn. Trading, you know, the, and is analogous, like the literal physics is the reading of the other market participant which is a much more, you know, uncertain, amorphous, confusing thing than swinging a baseball bat or a golf club. So if you understand that you're always trading other people, like when I first started, I can remember sitting upstairs at the SIBO in the first three months that I was trading with two guys who were seriously good day traders and them talking about like, hey, can't you see that they're doing this and they're doing that and he's doing that? And I was sitting there looking at the numbers, thinking, who's the he and who's the they? Because at that point in time, the market was still just those numbers moving around. Like I didn't, like I was missing the connection between that there were people's perception behind those numbers. So um, I would say, you know, in a perfect world, someone realizes this is a social game from the get-go like learning to play poker people know that poker is a social game you've got absolute meaning of the cards but even from like you know the very first time anyone teaches you to play poker they say yeah but you have to you know bet your cards versus what you think their cards are so you start thinking like that from the very beginning even though you have to learn all the technique of poker and the basic rules of poker and whatnot i think trading is the same I mean, not very many people do it because why? They don't feel confident that they know the rules of poker, let's say, or they don't feel confident that they know how to swing the golf club. So they think, learn the rules, learn the technique. But if you think about those situations, what's making the difference is the confidence, is, the, is one's belief about themselves. 
to one's belief about oneself is a psychological thing. It's not like a thing in a book over here. So you might as well start with it from the very beginning, even if it's, you know, okay, maybe you're not going to get super nuanced into every feeling you might have about the market. And you certainly should recognize, I don't have any intuition yet because I haven't done this enough times to have intuition. But my objective is to develop unconscious pattern recognition or intuition, which is, again, a mental psychological thing. I mean, like we're teaching this workshop and I'm starting this intensive workshop next week. And one of my clients had told me that he had a bunch of, of people that he had trained to trade and, you know, they would all want to take the workshop. And he came back and said, they all think they're not ready. So exactly what you're saying. Exactly <laughs> what you're saying. Is how common is that, that people that you speak to don't believe that they're actually ready to tackle and discuss trading psychology? I think because I, I think the reason is, is because they're not self-aware of actually what they need to tackle. Am I wrong on that? Yeah, yeah. They think they think to play poker, all they need is the rules. You know, that's the analogy. You think all you need is the perfect chart pattern. But your ability to act, I mean, even if, even if you, first of all, there is no perfect chart pattern, but um, exactly. you know, some are better than others. But like your ability to interpret that chart pattern is 100% a function of you reading other people in the market and, and knowing your own reactions. Like, I mean, here's another example, like Rethink Group is coaching a major league baseball pitcher. And the other day he tweeted that he chooses his pitches on conviction and intuition. Like those are his feelings, right? Based on his experience. So, you know, I can put it a different way. Like the, the secret to getting really great at anything is to is to understand the game and understand your reactions within the game, not just the, the technicals of the game. So like a new trader could say, I'm going to try to understand the market more as a social game. I'm going to try to understand my own reactions. I'm going to try to understand my level of confidence or belief in whatever system I'm experimenting with. Um, those are all mental, psychological, capital, trading psychology aspects of doing it. That just like the first time someone teaches you, you know, what three aces mean, you think, yeah, but what do three aces mean in relationship to other people? Like, you don't have a problem thinking about the psychology of it in poker, so why in trading? Yeah, example. Uh, for an example, you know, at what situation do you press that bet? At what this situation do you not? And I want to stay on reactions for a second because we've had this discussion in the past, and I think this is maybe something that could help traders identify whether or not – they to understand their self-awareness a little better and whether or not they need to start what issues they need to start working on for trading psychology. For me, what I used to, when I used to reflect on my day, you know, we talk about journaling our trades, but I was journal my day and, and how did I react in certain instances? Yeah. And some of the pain that I would feel in certain instances, I would remember that because of something that I did. So when I go to do that again, in that moment, it took me a while to, to kind of weed those out, but eventually I'm like, ah, you shouldn't be clicking here. You know how you're going to feel after you do this. So I was putting a feeling tied to an action that I was feeling just pissed at myself or whatever I was feeling after I did something. I'm like, do you really want to go through this right now, man? Do you really yeah. want to do this? So yeah. to, to me, that at that moment, I think one of the fine lines between going from a trader who is just you know paying the bills or, or struggling to actually making it is by in that moment you recognize where you really are before you click that button. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the human brain, like here's the thing that most people don't know, and the vast majority of performance psychology and training psychology doesn't get this yet. The brain is always predicting and particularly predicting a future feeling. And that is actually what we make the decisions on. Like people right now are predicting whether they're going to feel good or bad, depending on what 
you know, Tony and Denise say, like, is this going to make them more optimistic or less optimistic? They don't realize that, but it's happening. Like you can't, it's the sun rises in the east of human perception, judgment, always predicting a future feeling. So like your feelings are actually giving you information. So another thing that new traders get into, take the emotion out of it. First of all, if you really did it, it's, you couldn't even make the decision. You have exactly. to have confidence to make the decision. Confidence is what? If I make this decision, it's going to work out while you're making that prediction. So what you just described was using your emotions as information, which is exactly the way they are supposed to work. You, you make a choice. It turns out badly. You feel crappy, whatever choice it was, you know, trading or otherwise. The point of feeling crappy is so that you remember the next time exactly like you just said. Don't do that again. But two things happen. Everyone thinks they're supposed to take their emotions out of it. So they don't even ever get to recognize that feeling or analyze it. And two, if they they think they're supposed to always be positive. So, like forget about that negative feeling. That's actually there to help you, to teach you something, to stop you from doing the thing the next time, just like you said, and therefore you don't learn anything. And I look at it, exactly the way that you described it is that, you know, if I don't, if I don't take that emotion that I'm feeling in that moment, I don't learn anything about myself. I don't really learn anything about my trading, who I'm going to be as a trader. A big part of this journey is self-awareness. And I believe that it's helped me actually mold my strategy into something that's more fitting for me. I've yeah. put things into play technicals. This is where I think the technicals can come in and say, look at when you do this in this situation, put something to block you from that at that moment. You know, for example, I added confirmations to things like I'm a presser. I like to press my trades. Then I said, okay, you're pressing every time it goes your way a little bit. You're a junkie, you know, lay off it. How do you lay off of it? Put a confirmation in what is happening over here to then green light me to do it. And so I think that's where you have to find that balance of psychology and technicals because I wouldn't have done that if I wouldn't have pressed so many times in places just because I wanted to press. Eventually, right. I, I put something in place to help me with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you are the instrument and this is true for every trader. There's like the music and then there's the, the you know musician playing the music. Music says what it says but it's what the musician does with the signals that like gives us music that we like to listen to. So knowing yourself and knowing how you react, um, both positively and negatively turns into an edge. I mean, I've never put it this way before, but I'm just saying, you know, brand new trader. If you understand the market is like a social perception game, there is no reality. There's no right and wrong. No one knows what's going to happen. It's literally, you know, navigating the waves if you're a surfer. If you understand that from the get-go, you actually have a shot at tapping into your own natural people reading skills, because we all have them and people have them to greater or lesser degrees. In a way that like some people who have not done that for five or 10 or 15 years as a trader kind of have to unlearn so much stuff. You can really start at the beginning by learning again, what the game really is and then learning to understand your own reactions. I mean, the other thing is, you know, the truth of the matter is like the more complicated the analytical piece of it, this is, and everybody's trying to find the holy grail of technical analysis. You don't really want the holy grail of technical analysis. You want the, the combination of factors that's going to show you, you know, just a moment before everyone else, like what's likely to happen. So in a way, it's a sort of waste of time to spend years trying to find the holy grail of all of this. <laughs> I agree with that so much. It, as someone who's been trading for a long period of time now, I just want to know the direction that I, I really want to be in. And I don't need a ton of tools to tell me that. The market's okay. directions aren't that complicated. We complicate it. And yeah. I actually want to go to a tweet I put out the other day because you commented on it. And this tweet you, I put out the other day is, are you confident in your trading decisions? I said, if you aren't, you will have a weak hand of the market and your win probability decreases before you get in. If you are confident, your win probability increases, even if the trade idea is wrong. Executing with confidence is an edge. You've already mentioned this a bunch of times so far about confidence and you commented. Question is, how does one manufacture it? Right. 
right, right. Well, first of all, you have to like track it, rate it, like know when you are and when you aren't, as opposed to falling prey to the like, always have a positive attitude and always be confident. <laughs> like it doesn't really work. Like you have to be honest with yourself what you have confidence about and what you don't. And what you really want to know is what you don't have confidence about. And basically how unconfident or worried, concerned, doubtful, afraid, panic, you know, use any word on a, a, an opposite of confidence and intensity. You want to know the truth because then you can go, okay, this is what I'm not sure of. Okay. What would I have to do to get more surety? What would I have to do for this aspect? Like, I, okay, this guy taught me to use, you know, the 13 period exponential moving average, but do I really believe it? I don't know if I really believe it. Do I really believe that guy? I don't know. Is he really any good? Like all those questions are going on. I don't know if you use 13 period, anything. I just yeah. made that up off the top of my head. Um, because someone taught me to use it one time. Um, this is like, I spend a lot of my time when I'm coaching these clients of mine who run hundreds of millions to billions of dollars with like literally this exact question. Like, well, what do you really believe? What do you, John, actually think is gonna happen? And so then we find out like what they're confident about and what they're not confident about. And oftentimes I hang up a coaching call, you know, with professional portfolio managers who have institutional money and they're going to go off and research something that they realized they weren't quite sure of, or they didn't know what their intuition was. You know, what's your intuition? What's the intersection of intuition and confidence? Like intuition is you think something's going to happen. You're not sure, but you're kind of sure, really sure, not very sure. Like I've also found that the best trades come out of this, this um, synthesis of like intuitively, you're really sure. And you have, so you have confidence in that. But at the same time, you're like, why is this like, this seems too easy, what am I missing? And the ability to tolerate that doubt in the midst of confidence in an intuition. That's an actual mental state that if you can, first of all, find it, um, you, you've just developed an edge right there. But you got to find it for yourself. Like you have to listen to yourself. Um, so developing confidence can be an actual project, an actual strategy. So like we talk about creating new emotional experiences, which is a lot of, of what this workshop will be. How do you create new emotional experiences for yourself that you can draw on to better predict. So remember I was saying, we're always predicting a future feeling or we're always predicting a future feeling based on our past experience. So you have to create situations for yourself where that situation creates confidence. So like, again, learning a sport, what happens as you, you first of all, you don't know how to do it. And then you learn how to do it a little bit. You know, then you gain the confidence that you can hit your driver 180 yards straight. Like that's the process of training in a sport, gaining confidence. But traders rarely think to set themselves up a program where they train themselves into confidence. So that's what I was saying. That was a very long winded answer for that. But that's what I'm saying. And Pax is saying trust as opposite of fear. Trust is opposite of fear. Hmm, I guess I'd have to think about that specific one. I mean, what do I gain trust? You know, like I live in a ski mountain right out there. I trust that I can go out there and ski the, you know, black diamond without because I've been doing it. So trust is like, I believe I know I have confidence. But this actually brings up a good point. There's a skill called emotion differentiation or emotion granularity. Differentiation is like knowing the difference between fear, frustration, doubt, or trust. The research shows that the better you are at being granular about your feelings, the better decisions you make, particularly even in markets, the better you are at being granular about your feelings. So to pass this trust versus confidence or trust versus fear, like the exercise people can do is answer those questions about these different feeling mental state words for themselves decide what they think. 
Um, I could, I could probably wrap my head around trust and fear being sort of, because if you're trusting, you actually, you believe you have confidence that something's going to work out a certain way, right? Like I trusted, you know, I trusted you that you were going to show up at the time you said, and then we were going to do this and the tech was going to work because I know you and we've done it before. Like, so I was predicting how this was going to work based on my past experience. So I trusted, trusted meant what? I was confident this would work. Like we didn't practice or log on early or anything. You know, we didn't need to do that because we had an experience that generated confidence in both of us, how it is for the two of us to talk to each other. I want to stay on this a little bit and in, in hearing you talk and talking about, I think you've mentioned a little bit about it's like someone's background and how that could then impact um, their their trading. You know, for example, something that you do outside of your life or something that you've done in your past life. And then when you sit down at the screen, how that actually has an impact on the way you're trading. Um, is that an issue you see a lot of traders have? Oh, it's, it's an issue all humans have. So therefore, all traders have it. Um, I mean, again, you go back to the brain science, always predicting a feature feeling based on past experience. So that's true for all human beings. And um, the market, you know, is a particular kind of, of arena to do that in. And the market, you know, it functions like a Rorschach plot, you know, the ink plot, where people project onto it their own psychology. So what does that mean? They project onto it their own self-image. Do they expect to get what they want how do they get what they want like you know in my case i was like the good girl he was always on a time and always did my homework and all that kind of stuff so when i started trading what did i do i took every stop like i was religious about taking my stops because i was going to follow all the rules till the guy that i was working for called me up one day and is like i came hard you know and it was down like a dollar on the day and like buy more. And I was like, what? I don't even have enough capital. I own the firm. I'm like, I can't because I couldn't break the rules. So we have these, we have these self images that include what we think it takes for us to be safe, really. I mean, that's the underlying. And we execute in the market that way. So, um, you know, another really common one is people have, particularly guys, but I mean, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be guys. But I've seen a lot of guys who've had contentious relationships with their critical fathers. And when on certain days, when the market goes against these people and then they like go on tilt to use some people's term, I don't usually use that term, but they go crazy, you know, and it's their stop. What are they doing? They're reacting. The market in that moment is a critical father and they're reacting like, you're not going to mistreat me or you're not, you know, I'm going to prove to you I'm right. Like, and there are, as many of these things as there are fingerprints, because our individual psychological experience is just that. Like my fingerprint looks like yours, but you know, my version of fear of missing out versus yours. Well, first of all, we're never going to be able to know exactly because all we have is language and I'm not going to know what it's like to be inside your body. But um, I think, I actually think this is fractal. I mean, I wrote about it in Market Mind Games now a decade ago, which is unbelievable to me, that literally our psyches develop you know, where we have these experiences as children that give us expectations of how we'll be treated in the world. And then when the price is not behaving the way we want, we start to expect that same thing. And then we react more out of the past, which is where our brains built, than we are about the future or about the, even the present. So the trick is to learn that stuff about yourself. Like I finally learned in trading that I didn't have to be the good girl, that I actually could break the rules sometimes because I had enough experience to like be able to tell when I could and when I couldn't. And, you know, I, I have some like an amazing trades at breaking the rules. Um, Me too. <laughs> so, you know, and like I did this workshop in Sun Valley, the first live in-person one I'd done for the public since 2007, actually. And that's what I took people through, like that really the, the, you know, the depths of how our own self-image and our own feelings about safety and our future come out to play. And everyone in that workshop could see that whatever the thing is they do in the market, and most of those people were successful traders, that we all have things we wish we'd do differently, right? It came back to these predictions they were making that 
that tied back to their self-image, that tied back to like their first 10 years of life. And I know it sounds crazy, but then if you really think about it, how could it be any other way? Like, you know, you look at a tree. I mean, I, I'm living in the midst of trees and the top of that tree is based on those roots. It's like way out there and over there by 60 feet. Like human beings are the same way. So yes, again, a long-winded answer saying yes, Anthony, you were right. <laughs> no, you know, um, we're going to take a quick break here. When I, when I come back, I want to talk about a few things. First of all, I see everybody's putting questions in right now. We're going to get to questions with Denise. I see Tom's questions, a lot, a lot of questions out there uh, that we're going to talk with Denise. But I want to talk about developing instincts because I recently did a show on this. And I want to talk about instincts versus rules because I think that so many people focus on rules and they try to find all these rules for the trading. And, you know, I keep notepads at my desk and I write down uh, all sorts of different things on them. Uh, and I remember when I was doing my rules, I wrote down all my rules and I'd go and trade and then I'd be like, well, hold on a minute. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that rule and I just broke it. Uh, I think this ties into a lot of what we're, the discussion is that I, so I started to think you can't have something that's written on a piece of paper, all these rules. you got to actually develop instincts. And how do you do that? Uh, and. You know, I think a quick story I think is important about this and why I started to think that way was because I, I talking about my background versus then becoming a trader. I think a lot of traders out there will understand this. I was big brother. I was in sports, always competing. And then when I would go and lose to my younger brothers or to my friends, I'd work that much harder. A lot of times it'd be in basketball or whatever we were doing. And I try to physically will myself back to, you know, um, a stronger position and try to win the next time. And in trading, that's the revenge trade. Like, I'm going to try and get it back right now. I'm going to try to do this right now. And you try to just, you take that anger and frustration and you try to push it on the market and the market just pushes back really hard. So I had to develop an instinct to know when to stop. So recognize that at that moment, look at man, this is not the same as playing basketball outside with your brothers and your friends. You can't physically push this stuff. You have to instinctually know that this is different uh, and the market yeah. doesn't care about that. Yep, so, yep, 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 yep. I can talk about that all day long. All right, cool. So what we're going to do, everybody, is we're going to start putting your questions in into chat, and Denise and I are going to start answering your questions. We'll be back in 30 seconds. Replace your exchange with TradeStation Crypto. Dealing with multiple exchanges is complicated, and it takes time, except with TradeStation Crypto. Because we are not an exchange. We are a broker. You have access to multiple pools of liquidity, all in one platform, in one account, one way. Trade crypto your way. Plus, earn interest on your eligible cryptocurrencies. Get started in one click. Trade the global markets with trading technologies. TT is the world's fastest commercially available futures trading platform. Now with integrated tools for advanced options trading, cryptocurrencies, and trade surveillance. Learn more at tradingtechnologies.com. Like I said, everybody, we're about to take questions with Denise. If you're watching on Twitter on the live stream, hop over to YouTube because I'm going to take all of the questions from the comment section there. So, Denise, let's continue to where we were talking about instincts versus rules. Your thoughts on this? Unconscious pattern recognition, visceral intelligence, intuition, somatic intelligence. Like, they're all intelligence that's in your body and if you think about like how does anyone go from amateur to expert like it becomes less of one two three four you know pull my club back make sure my arm's straight like you just have a feel for it why does an expert why isn't why is someone who's 40 years old in any job able to do something better generally than any 22 year old dead kate bounce notwithstanding um Hi, Kate. <laughs> yeah, or Riley Coleman. Um, not Coleman. I got the Riley wrong. Rosenberg. Um, but in any event, like it's because when you're young and you're just starting out, you have to do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And the more experience you get, the less you have to do that linearly, cognitively, explicitly, the more the knowledge goes into your body. I mean, how does anyone putt? You know, you look and you you get a feel for like, you can't really say. I mean, sort of you can. the ball, But Really, it's like you look at it and your body tells you kind of where you need to, to aim the ball. So it's a thing to be developed and it's real. And a, a moment ago, I said, um, 
like with all my professional investors and traders, I'm always getting them to think about, you know, what they're concerned about, what they don't really believe. But if I summarize what I do at the end of the day, it's help these people act on their intuition. Like it's absolutely, and intuition instincts, I think are synonymous, but they need developed. Like when you first start out, you don't have any because you have no experience. And so again, a brand new trader thinking in terms of how do I develop my understanding of the market as people and my intuition about that. Um, as a specific strategy for getting better as opposed to how do I find the very specific thing? I mean, there's oodles of research showing that intuition is a valid form of knowledge, despite what a lot of people like to say. The, prop, like the people who criticize gut instinct or intuition, what they're really doing is they don't understand that people don't understand that you have different categories of feelings. And you, you know, broadly speaking for trading, you can lump them into intuition instinct versus impulse. And at the back to your self-awareness, the job is to learn which is which for you. You know, how much energy or agitation should you have when the trade is right? And where do you, like you were just speaking, you basically, like there's sometimes you can tell you're going over the line, like, yes. right? Like you reminded me, I had a client, I just have to tell this story. Um, fabulous trader, had worked for London banks and hedge fund managers and had retired, you know, with his own number, some double digit millions. And his problem was what you always said. Like when, when he would get in certain circumstances, he would just press, 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 press and get huge. And like, he couldn't stop himself. And we finally realized that like his life MO was based on the fact that he was like 6'4", 230 pounds and played rugby in Europe for his first 18 <laughs> years of life. So when you play rugby for Europe and you're 6'4", and 230 pounds, what's your MO? Go, go, go. And so what I had him do, he had two young daughters. They were like two and four at the time. I said, trade like you wrestle with your daughters. Mm. So what did that get? It gave him that feeling of playing with them and inter but not obviously he wasn't wrestling with them like he was capable of. And once he invoked that feeling, he was able to stop himself from getting crazy big and of course the wrong positions. I this did why, a little bit there from intuition. But. No, but this, no, this is exactly, this is why I think you're the best at helping traders understand this because of that exact story. Something you're doing over here, you don't recognize it. And here's a person who has made millions of dollars, done extremely well, trying to do what they've done in their life to be successful in other places or other habits that they have and they bring it to the trading screen and even someone as good as this doesn't quite recognize it at that moment and then you help them understand it and once we do have that self-awareness and know what it is and, and as i said earlier this is what differentiates a trader who i think really makes it from not if you could fix something in in this situation before it happens Versus talking about it later saying, I knew I shouldn't have done that, but I did it anyway. And, and sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. And that's why I work so hard on developing instincts because I am that person. I always feel like I, I could make it work. You know, I mean, that's just where I'm at. I'm, I'm Oh, right now I'm going to press here. I'm going to do this. And, and you have to put things for people like myself, who's such a competitor. And I, and I feel like I could always make something happen in uh in place and a big thing is the self-awareness i want to get to some of the questions let, let me ask you a, let me ask you a question that first did okay. you just say you were the oldest brother yes okay so think about that while you were growing up in relationship to your brothers you always could make something happen because you were older and bigger and smarter exactly so you got this feeling like and so i then have the opposite i have clients who are the youngest who feel like they can never make something happen, you know, or they're not like brilliant clients who think they're not the smartest one, because what we take it back, like, look, your older brother was three years older than you and six years older than you. They always, they were always bigger. They always knew stuff. But that was just an, exa an, an opposite example that I wanted to make clear to people, like how our experiences growing up will play out in our self image and then how we attack the market. No, I mean, absolutely. And there's a good and bad side to that, right? The belief that yeah. you can, sorry. No, I, I like I, talking I, to you and I've had caffeine. Like there's yeah. a belief that you can, and then the belief goes over the line. And how do you know the difference? Like, you know, the difference th through self-knowledge. Yeah. I mean, that's why I want to go to this question right now from Jan 
Forster, self-aware. So get better at observing yourself as much as possible. Yeah. But what does that really mean? Like you, you want to know what you're feeling and why. I mean, I've said that before, like that the thing is, what am I feeling and why? Now you don't have to have the full why to like make a trade, but in general, you want to know why. Um, but you first want to know what, for most people who are starting out, just what, like, what is this feeling? And if oftentimes people aren't even going to be able to tell because you've, you know, had lifetimes of being told not to know what you're feeling or to shove your feelings aside, get out, you know, you think you feel afraid or you think you feel worried, um, get out a dictionary or, or thesaurus, or, you know, obviously you've got a computer and look up the word you sort of kind of think, and then look at the other word and see if there's a word that fits like, what you're experiencing. What you'll find is if you get it right, the feeling gets more informational and less interruptive. Mm. Mm. I like that. More informational and less interruptive. I'm going to be using that in future shows. Your psyche is trying to get a, a message to you. I mean, this is the thing that people don't get. All feelings in their pure form, and I can say, you know, are trying to give you information. And so like you're drowning it out because you've been told to drown it out and you think you need to be mentally tough and you think you need to be confident. So you're missing all this information. Then the trick is to learn for your personal experience as an adult, what is the pure feeling, which is the instinct feeling? What's the informational feeling versus what's the impulse feeling, which is some other psychological need to you know be smart or right or not lose money or whatever. I want to move on to this question. I think this is a great topic and thank you so much for, um, I'm, I'm probably going to butcher your name. It's Asanur Fadan. Um, she says, hello there. Uh, what do you think about burnout? I was there and stopped trading for three months. It was a game changer. Now I am back for the first time doing the right things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, burnout's a real thing, what, but what does it really oh, mean? Oh. It means like we get emotionally overwhelmed. Like we, you know, we, we lose our energy, we lose our motivation, we lose our optimism, we just had too much. And it can happen on a daily basis, a weekly basis, monthly basis, yearly basis. Um, but again, how to like people have to know and they have to be okay. Like you don't have to take every trade in your plan. That's like the one that's like maybe the biggest myth in trading. You have to take the trades that you're capable, psychologically capable of executing. Otherwise, you've just decimated your your odds or your probability. So like knowing when you're physically slash emotionally drained, which is what I would say burnout is, and you know, doing the smart thing and giving yourself a break. Like this is an issue I end up having with athletes. No. Take the day off, because if you don't, you're raising the chances of you getting injured worse. It's the same. You trade in the burnout state and, you know, you raise the odds of losing money. I mean, no doubt. And I think that traders need to understand, especially new traders, that trading is a very different business than anything else you've ever done. The more you work doesn't mean you're going to get more results. The market does not care about that. It's about working smarter and in the right times. And I've said so many times on Twitter, you make money in moments. If I look at a hundred trades I've had, there's times where I'll be wrong 80 to 90 of them, but the 10 I was right, I make more money than the 80 to 90%. That's why everyone searches for this 80, 20, the opposite way, 80% win rate. When it's like, I might be scratching a bunch of trades. There's certain times uh, where I'm just not feeling right. And all of a sudden everything's going well for me. And I, and I could kill it, but that's, that takes time and experience to get there as well, but you're not going to get there when you're burned out and, you know, and bloated Tony Danza <laughs> says, hello, Tony, I was seriously burned trading, spent six months and retrospective came out with a simple, great process to trade. Now I'm achieving gains consistently, but I left money on the table. So, I mean, there's some thoughts here on that one, Denise. You know, this is so not a game of perfect. Um, yeah. Look, almost everyone, almost all of the time is going to leave money on the table. It's just the way it is. I mean, you think about it. Trade's working um, no matter, basically almost no matter what you do, it's the wrong thing. If you get out, it could go further. If you don't get out, it could pull back. Like, no matter what you do when it's working, it's the wrong thing. 
So yeah, every once in a while, you're going to nail it almost perfectly. And that's going to feel great. And it's not even just luck. I mean, it's a lot luck, but it, you know, it's also some experience where you just can tell within, when the momentum's waning. By the way, there is a research study that shows traders who can get out when the momentum's waning, there is like a particular signal in the brain, um, which I'm sure relates to predicting other people. But in any event, um, so what do you say? Okay, like I get really frustrated that I leave money on the table. Okay, what would I have to, what would have to happen differently? This is that, how does it feel when I'm getting out ostensibly too early? Cause I assume that's how you're leaving money on the table, but maybe not, you could just be getting out too late and let it pull back. Um, we got to figure out what you're feeling in those moments and a layered thing. So there's always confidence. Then there's like fear of missing out and future regret and being wrong. And this is where it starts to get into fingerprints. Like what's the person's personal experience? Do you just feel like the market will give you what you want? Or does it feel like, oh my God, I got to take the money now. And that's, you know, going to be different person to person to person. But figuring that out then gives you the path to be able to tolerate that feeling the next time and get a little bit more out of that next trade, which gives you a different emotional experience that then you can draw on the time after that. I want to move on to this question from Tom Halpenny. I love this question, Tom. Thank you for putting it out there. Can you discuss the tendency for some to lean towards counter trend trades? <laughs> Need to be smart. I've done it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. I, I hate to be glib about that, but generally speaking, it's need to prove to someone you're smart and it's probably proved to someone, you know, in your first 10 or 20 years of life. I mean, the, the, how does that actually happen? I mean, sometimes people are hesitant to get in on a trend, hesitant to take a trade, and then, you know, the price moves a fair amount and then they're frustrated. And out of frustration, the only thing they can think to do is take the opposite side. So there's that, which is a relatively superficial thing that really ha starts with the fear to take the trade in the first place. But people who compulsively, habitually, as a matter of character, fight the trend, generally are trying to prove they're smart. And like I said, trying to prove they're smart, not in the here and now to themselves. I mean, a little bit in the here and now to themselves, but usually can go back and find in their life you know, someone who didn't believe in them that they're kind of getting revenge against. And for me, a big part of it, a lot of the times was I missed the trend and I'm trying to make a quick buck, you know, right, you're, trying to, right, you're, right, trying, right, you're right. sitting there, you're looking at it going, oh, well, these things are topping here. Let me just sell a few, few S and P's here. And I'll, I'll come back a few ticks and I'll just, you know, just the next thing you know, you, you're short a bunch and, and they're, they keep making new highs. <laughs> yeah. 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 Like, like the bird that runs out to get a little, you know, a little seed, like that's what you're doing. And that's it. it. What you have to do is, I mean, what you don't have to do, but what works better is if you tolerate the frustration, like, okay, I'm mad at myself because I missed this and I hesitated. Like, okay, like where's my next best place to get in? Because things always rock and roll and pull back a little bit. You always get a second, third, fourth jam, particularly I this know, market. I, I think about how many times too, you know, for the example, when I'm trying to make a thousand bucks a day, I'd have a good trade. I'd be up 950 bucks. Oh boy, I want to make a thousand. Next thing you know, I try to go in against the trend to make 50 bucks and I go from being up 950 to down 1950. <laughs> the exact I mean, I can problem. laugh about it because I've done it so many times. The exact problem with dollars per day or dollars per anything. Yeah. Oh, dollars I agree per day. It generally, I mean, if you're strategically trying to create a different emotional experience for yourself, and you're conscious that that's what you're trying to do, like, and you do it for those reasons, that's one thing. That's a training wheels exercise. If you think it's a good idea in general, it inevitably leads to what you just said. And then you're not there to make the $5,000 on the day the market's giving it to you. I think this fits right into what we're talking about here. We got R. Matthew Sheely asking, can you talk about why traders sabotage their success? Oh, well, do we have enough time for this one? <laughs> this one, how many times I've done this to myself? The big answer is there's, you know, again, it's fingerprints. There's a, a you know, millions of personal, of detailed personal reasons. 
But having said that, generically, um, there's a like lack of belief in deserving the success, fear of what the success will mean. Um, yeah, those are two big generic categories. I'm going to say this thing, which probably isn't going to make that much sense, and, but it's nevertheless true. There's a phenomenon that when people have unconscious anger that they're afraid to recognize, they turn it on themselves and prevent themselves from succeeding. Now, the detail of that is obviously beyond today, and it's also like something when we recognize it in in our coaching and rethink we're really we tread really carefully and lightly because when you have that set up you have it for a reason like not recognize the anger kept you safe in some circumstance but the trick to to growing to being all you're capable of is being able to recognize it without guilt or shame or fear but that's a process so like I've said a bunch of different things in response to self-sabotage. Again, though, what is it? It's what am I feeling and why in getting the answers both right. And some of the things you may, it may be so far out of your conscious experience that it's going to take time to know what you're really feeling. I want to share a couple of stories with Matthew and I think everybody else, I think they can relate to this when you talk about traders sabotaging their success. I think most people know my story. I went through three accounts of $25,000, um, blew them all until eventually finally found some success in trading. Took me a few years. And one thing about that path was every time I'd get the fresh $25,000 in there, I was good for, let's just say five months. The first one was like six months I went through. The next one was like a year. The next one was a year and a half. I was good keeping that account afloat all the way until it got down. And maybe I get to less than 10,000 or right around 5,000, all of a sudden, all my risk rules went out the window. Now I'm just saying, I don't even care anymore. I'm so sick of this. And I just, all of a sudden I'm debit or, you know, the account's at zero and I'm, I'm starting over. I felt like it was a cry for help because at that point in time, no matter how good I had gotten, I was not getting the success I wanted. And the frustration inside me just, it just really pissed me off that I was back to this point. And then all of a sudden I just throw my hands up in the air and, and what I, I was a better risk manager with 25 to 50,000 than I was with 5,000. And it makes yeah, yeah. no You're sense. Like a, the hell with it. As I just give up. And, and so I did that to myself. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think about yeah. that, Denise? Why does that happen? Well, that's exactly right. You're disgusted with it. And like, you just don't want to do it anymore. So lose the rest. I mean, I did that once I traded the guy that got me into trading was a, on the floor of the SIBO for a long time. And then years later, we decided to try to trade an account together because he was like great at the strategy side of it. And of course, he's the good girl. I was good at the risk management side. So our agreement was he could get in anywhere he wanted and I could get out anywhere I wanted, period. No questions asked, period. Um, and it worked really well for a long time. Now, he had a need to prove he was smart and, and react against that overly critical father. So like one day he's getting really agitated and I'm getting out because like it's time to get out of whatever it was, Smith Klein Glaxo or something. And he just got so mad at me. And I was just like, forget this. I'm not having you scream at me. And I like, I lost the rest of the account. Like, I don't know, maybe two days. I kind of think it was only one. Like you, I just wanted out. Like I just wanted out of this situation. Like it's just too painful. Now, if I'd had the skill, to emotionally differentiate the pain and what it was really about, I would have gained the ability to not have to lose the money. Because all we're doing, all you're doing and all I was doing was acting out the frustration and pain and trying to make it go away. Yeah, and then later in my career, but, I mean, sorry, Diane. Uh, you, and, you I was like, and then we're so mad at ourselves. And so then we, we you know, then there's another, I mean, I wasn't mad at myself about getting out of that situation. But. And I think to, to talk about this a lot, I know a lot of traders that have gone through a situation uh, that I've gone through. And I, I know that Pax and I have talked about this is that then you finally have success, you make some money and now you feel guilty about it. And you just start giving it back in stupid ways. Friends need money, throw it at this, throw it at that. Uh, you know, and all of a sudden now I, I was uncomfortable having the amount of money that I had. 
And it took me a long time. And I was, I really felt, I remember my wife discussing this with me, you know, friends being like, what are you doing, man? You're just, you're just pissing this away. Like, you know, smarten up. And subconsciously, I'm just, I felt like I wasn't, I, sh I didn't deserve it. Yeah. And that came from something in your past. I mean, sometimes it's, you know, and I have no idea your actual background, but like, let's take mine, you know, growing up in Akron, Ohio, in the first college graduate, like, I could have felt like I didn't have the right to make the money, particularly being a female from a conservative Christian background where I was like supposed to be, you know, I shouldn't finish that sentence. By the way, I've got an 11 o'clock client. Just yeah, now. we got, we've got four, we are going to go over a couple of quick things and then we'll let you go. I know uh, you're taking a lot of time with us today. So I'm going to just breeze through some of these questions. Maybe we'll give them some quick answers. I don't want to make people feel like I left them out. Um, uh, Sun Kite says, how does a trader know when to listen to his or her intuition? Well, you've got to learn that, right? Um, I will say this intuition is really calm. It's just like, I know, I have to know. And anything other than intuition impulse is energized. I got to do, I got to do, I got to do. It's urgent. Like intuition is the kind of thing that you can decide to ignore and not feel bad about like, I don't, whatever. I don't have the mental bandwidth. I don't have the capital. I'm too busy. I can't take the trade. You won't feel bad about it. You'll be like, okay, like I see what's happening, but I just am not in the space to execute this trade. If it's, if it's impulse, you're going to feel like, Oh my God, I have to do this. And I can't miss it. Let's go to David instincts and rules equal art. Do you agree? Instinct and rules equal art. I can live with that. Some of these questions are similar because I know you got to go in a minute here. I think it's a good time to talk about your books. There's been a lot of discussion in the comments section. I know that Patrick, uh, Henry, and a few other people have put put your books out there in the chat. But for those listening on audio only, uh, Denise, is there one or two books that you've you know talk about the your books? Well, my book is Market Mind Games, which is ten years old almost. Um, which is why we're doing this workshop. You can find it on our website called Market Mind Games Live. I've never done anything called Market Mind Games. Um, books that people should read are Lisa Feldman Barrett's books, How Emotions Are Made and Seven and a Half Lessons About the Brain. Um, Antonio Damasio, Descartes Air, which is old now, but like that's about, Descartes said, you know, I think therefore I am. And Damasio is like, no, no, you feel therefore you are. Like it's a process to go from everything's in my brain and I need to like suppress my feelings and put them behind me and be positive. Like you can listen to me and think, oh, that's right. And then you're going to go away and think it's going to be really hard because you have a lifetime of learning the other. So those books, Feldman Barrett and, and Damasio are some neuroscientists who maybe can persuade you. Denise, uh, it's always a pleasure to speak with you. You're so great taking the time to speak with me, answer all these questions from everybody uh, joining us here today on the live stream. Where can people follow you on Twitter? First of all, if you're not following Denise on Twitter, I mean, I don't know what to even say. And give us a website to learn more about you. Yeah, it's Denise K. Scholl on Twitter. But it, the, our website is therethinkgroup.net. The therethinkgroup.net. Yeah. And if you follow me on Twitter, you could see Denise's uh, Twitter link in for today's show. Denise, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to call Likewise. you a friend. Thank you so much for joining me today on the live stream. Great. Thanks for having me. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> I could too. Thank you again, okay. Denise. I'll Bye. see you soon. Bye-bye. Yeah, thanks, everyone. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in today. How great was that with Denise? And all I could say is if you enjoyed this podcast, Give me the thumbs up, the like on YouTube. Also hit that subscribe button so you don't miss an episode of Futures Radio Show. Live streams uh, have been consistent every week on Twitter and on YouTube. Uh, and once again, everybody, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for the questions. I appreciate it. And I will see all of you guys next week for Larry Williams. going to be a big show. See you, everybody. Thank you for listening to Futures Radio Show. If you enjoyed the show, please leave a five-star review on iTunes. Never miss an episode. Go to anthonycrudelli.com and get on our email list for show notifications and for free content that is exclusively for subscribers. 
Also on AnthonyCredelli.com, you will find tons of videos and education on trading futures, options, and crypto. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Opinions expressed are solely my own and my guests, and they do not express the views or opinions of my sponsors. Futures Radio Show is produced by Crudelli Productions.